chapter three, we're, again, we're going to talk about information systems and the relationship between information systems and organizations. And we get into a lot of detail as to what constitutes an organization, um, what, so what are some of the, um, the uh, elements that make up an organization, decision making. We, we actually look at organizations through a couple of different theories um, to examine how organizations um, are affected by IT. Okay, and then we and then we talk about those quarter frameworks. Okay. So organizations and information systems influence one another. Okay, and the influence that they have it's going to be different from one organization to another. You could take two identical organizations in the same um, industry, and the way that they use information systems, the type of systems that work for them is going to be different, okay? And there's based on a lot of these different factors, right? Things like the politics, the culture of the organization, right? We, you probably have heard of some of, um, some famous kind of IT companies like Google that have very interesting and different um, organization cultures. Right, um, Google. I, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Google's organizational culture, but they support a very non-traditional work experience. They have, um, they have a lot of um, leisure activities that people are are um, are um, encouraged to take part in because they think that it, it it helps to get the creative juices flowing. They have a lot of non-financial benefits that they offer to people. Because um, they recognize that one of the things that organizations need to do to retain top level um, talent is to um, offer them financial as well as other non-financial uh, life, um, life, general life benefiting um, uh, types of, um, of uh, types of uh, benefits. Okay, but when you're looking at an organization, there's a lot of different factors that influence organization. Right? The environment, the outside environment, the politics, right? Um, for every organization, there's going to be a different set of politics because you have different sets of people that are working together, okay? Um, the business processes, we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about business processes, although we, we introduced that concept earlier um, last week. Um, so let's take a look at this. So again, with all of these mediating factors in there, um, the culture, the environment, the politics, um, different management decisions that are made, um, there is this relationship, this um, continuously changing relationship between an organization and its systems. Okay, and um, the, the, the role that information systems play plays in every organization, pretty much every organization nowadays has changed in the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. Okay, IT used to be the kind of thing that was a back office only. Um, it supported our, your, it supported your administration, human resources, it supported a lot of your back office um, activities, but it wasn't at the forefront of, and, and really embedded in everything that we do. Okay. So this relationship is, is reciprocal, it's a two-way relationship, and we're going to try to, to look at some tools, some, we're going to try to examine this relationship further, okay? So we can start by asking what is a relationship, I mean, what is an organization, sorry. Um, that, and you can look at two different types of definitions. A technical definition, which really says that an organization is basically a set of inputs from the environment, things that we're pu pulling in, resources we're pulling in from our environment. Um, we're going to process those inputs, turn them into a product or a service, and then we're going to send that product and service as one of the outputs to the environment. Okay? Um, and, and again, with this production process, um, 20 years ago, it would have, most organizations would have been manufacturing organizations, but now we have a lot of service industry organizations. Um, you can also look at it as a legal entity, a formal legal entity with internal rules and procedures, um, as well as a social structure. So, for this technical definition, it mentions the uh, the the um, fact that you have people in the mix. Okay, there's a social structure that, but it doesn't really. It still kind of makes it look like. If we were if we were going to um, to uh, 
implement new systems in this structure, right? It doesn't make it sound like it's too hard, right? It, we just change something in the production process or how we get our inputs or, or out, out, outputs. Um, and, and it's, you know, it makes it sound kind of simple to implement new systems and change the way we do things, okay? The behavioral definition recognizes that there are people in the mix and that there, because there are people and there are um, relationships between people, there are understandings about, unspoken understandings about the roles that people play, right? You have supervisors and their employees that have an unspoken understanding about how they get the work done. Okay, there's not necessarily, you have job titles and, def and information about the jobs, but when it actually comes to doing those jobs, there are kind of unspoken rules about how you get things done and how a particular supervisor may want things done, right? If you've ever moved laterally in an organization, change from one supervisor to another, you know that although you're doing the same job, you, you have to adjust the way that you're doing things to meet the expectations of a particular person. Okay, so this behavioral definition recognizes the fact that there are people there and that, that all of the different, um, all of the different um, elements that come with having people in the mix uh, makes it so that we have to, that change is not as easy as we would think of when we look at that, that technical definition. Okay, that there are, you know, change management, you, you have some other factors that, um, that may affect the um, how easy it would be to change to make changes to implement a new system to implement a new way of doing things to change business processes. Okay, and now these two different definitions. If you had to look at these definitions, the technical and the behavioral, is there one that you think would be um, more? Um, I won't say more right, but what you would think you kind of think might be more. Um, more descriptive of the organizations maybe that you've been a part of? Huh? The behavioral? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Now these two definitions, they're not, um, they're, they're not, they're actually very, um, um, they work together because they're describing a, an organization from two different lenses, but it's the same organization. Okay, so these are not made, it's not really that one's more right than the other, it's that it's recognizing that there are all different facets to any organization. Okay, this is the, the view of that behavioral view of the organization. Right, what would happen if we didn't have, if we had organizations without a hierarchy? There would be no chain of command. There wouldn't be a chain of command, right? Um, and, you know, you'd have people trying to get things done but wouldn't necessarily know who to answer to, right? It's like chaos. Um, so when we look at these different pieces, I mean, these are, these are things that every organization has because there's a need to have those, these things, okay? Some of the features, of course, a hierarchical structure. Um, accountability, right? Who do you... Um, how do you make sure that people are doing the things that they're supposed to be doing? Um, adherence to some kind of principle of efficiency. Trying to um, have the greatest amount of output for the minimal, uh, as minimal as possible um, input. So, you know, making sure that you have, um, you know, that you're making some kind of profit. Less lowering the cost as much as possible. Um, and raising the price to whatever the market will bear or whatever your particular niche of the market will bear, right? Um, routines and business processes, we're going to look at these in a little bit more detail. Routines are small tasks that actually make up, a collection of routines will make up a complete business process, okay? But a routine is, um, you know, a task that you would do in a particular job, okay? so. Um, as a you know, as an instructor, one of the the many routines that I that that are part of my job is creating um, course materials, going into Blackboard and actually putting up and making available materials, assignments, things like that. Creating a syllabus, making changes to the syllabus if needed from one term to another. Right? Those would be small tasks that make up 
the, you know, the job that I have. So can you name some other tasks that, and when you talk about an organization, you don't have to, you know, you can, you don't have to name the organization per se if you don't want to, it's up to you, right? What are some tasks that you have had to perform in different jobs? Reports. Reports, right? Maybe creating reports or um, uh, making those available. Customer service. And customer service has a very is a very big category, right? There's a lot of stuff that goes in it. It's going to be different from one uh, from one job to another, from one uh, store to another. If, um, you know, a lot of my early employment history is retail, so <laughs> I'm pretty familiar with. I worked um, as a uh, service deli um, person in Vons for like eight years, um, and so in, in the grocery stores they have that secret shopper thing. And so they, you know, they make sure that you're always making kind contact with people, talking to people. I remember I would go from uh, to another store that wasn't my store, and I would shop, and I'd get mad when people weren't making eye contact with me, or or, or were. I think, you know, if that was me, I would, you know, I would probably get a reprimand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of an expectation of I should receive as good as good of service as I give on my daily routine, right? But yeah, customer service is a very big um, category. Anything else? Any other routine that um, that you have in a, a job that you may have had before or that you have now? Manufacturing processes. Different manufacturing processes, right? Uh huh. Okay. So and again, these routines, these small tasks, make up these full business processes. Okay. And then of course, all of the politics, culture, and things like that. That. Uh, that make up and make each organization different, okay? So as you can see, these individual routines, a collection collection of these individual routines make up different business processes within the organization. Now, business processes are going to be important as we move forward because we're going to talk about information systems and certain categories of systems look at organizations as a collection of business processes. So we're going to revisit this idea of business processes later on. Okay? And then of course all of these different business processes make up an organization or they call it a business firm here. Okay? Um, organizational politics, um, because you have so many different people in different levels of an organization, different um, points of view, different ideas about how um, the organization should move forward, what, you know, how they should react to mark the environment, right? You can, it can lead to a lot of struggle, okay? Um, your politics, it can hamper your ability to make change and to um, react to dip changes in a particular industry or market that you're in. Okay. Um, can you think of any kind of generic situations you might have had that um, where organization politics may have hampered um, the the or your organization's ability to uh, you know to move forward or to do uh, to do you know make to uh, to change. I, can, I mean, I can give you uh, a generic example, being in academia, <laughs> as long as I have, which is about eight years. Um, I see politics embedded in the way that we look at things like academic freedom. Um, academic freedom is this idea that um, uh, professors or instructors should be, avail should be able to teach their classes the way they see fit without um, administration coming in and telling them how to do it. Okay. Um, th things like, um, I, because I'm one of those, I'm one of those people that I don't mind, um, incorporating different things or making changes if there's stuff that will benefit the department, but there's other ones where you see, you, at, you ask them to, um, have a single syllabus for everybody to use, and oh, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion and, um, and, and anger about this idea of having administration or the department chair coming in and telling you these are the things that you need to do. This is the way you need to structure your syllabus. 
things that for me, you know, I'm like, okay, that's what you want me to do. I'll work within the confines, but I'm, you know, a, a little bit different. So, um, of course, different organizational politics. Um, but again, this is one of those behavioral things that can hamper change with, and, and actually possibly keep an organization from being successful, okay? The, the culture, now the culture of an organization is a little bit different than the politics. The culture is a set of assumptions, a shared understanding across the organization that this is what our company does. These are the goals that we have set forth for us. This is what we do and how we do it. Okay? Um, and this shared understanding helps. It, it's nothing that's written down most of the time. It might be, you might see it a little bit in like your mission statement or things like that. But for the most part, it's just, um, it's just kind of an unspoken understanding of how we do things as a company and, you know, our strategy moving forward. Okay, it can be a very unifying thing, but it can also, again, hamper change. If you have this, you might have very um, embedded assumptions about what we do, and if there's an opportunity to make changes, the culture could keep the company from changing. So I can give you an example. Um, Kodak. Kodak was um, the, the top number one um, photography company in the world about 15, 20, maybe, maybe closer to 25 years ago, okay? Right, Polaroid cameras, all of that. I mean, they were, they were when it came to film cameras, they were um, on top of their game, okay? But they did not recognize that there was a move to, away from film cameras toward digital cameras. Okay, toward digital photography, um, and because they did not recognize that move, you had Canon and Minolta and a lot of other uh, photography companies that recognized that, that invested in R and D to try to um, to try to improve the technology of their digital cameras, and they actually, I mean. Um, Kodak's still around, but they're not a major player in digital cameras in any way, shape, or form. And really, that's the where where the money is at, right? Um, I don't, you know, if you remember using 35 millimeter cameras, right? You have to change the film. You get 20, you know, 27 pictures to the roll. Um, you couldn't see a single picture until you were done with the roll, and you took it in to be, right? Um, you know, that's that's for the most part. Most people, you know, don't. You know, don't don't do that unless they're like probably professional photographers, right? So the market for that the market changed, and Kodak did not change. I think it was a part of their organizational culture. It probably played a very a big part in that, right? Just this the idea of hey, you know, we we do this, we do this well, and although we see something on the horizon, we don't really think it's going to be something that's going to change our industry, and it was, okay. Your environments in your organization. Now, we're going to actually look at um, the five forces model, which is a way of examining the major forces that um, in your business environment. Okay, but um, organizations um, are are to a certain extent dependent on their environment, right? What are some of the the inputs that organizations are dependent on their outside environment for? What do organizations need, need that they have to get from their outside environment? They need right. They need to have knowledge about marketing knowledge about what their consumers want. Although unless they're Apple, <laughs> Apple it has is notorious for not doing any market testing of their products. Um, they keep a very they keep their their technology very close. Um, close to their chest kind of thing and they um, so you know so far it's worked for them but most other companies they want to test their products before they invest heavily and and uh, decide to move forward in the market with a new product or, um, or you know new some something that's new new technology right 
So they need to know what their what their customers want. Right? What else? Supplier. Huh? Suppliers. Supplies, right? They need to get supplies. Right? Most companies, um, you have this trade-off between what can what can we do in-house and what do we have to go to other organizations to get done? Right? You can talk about outsourcing where um, certain parts of your business you um, pay somebody else to do that, right? For costs or for other reasons. Okay? What about people? Right? They need employees. They have to get that from the outside environment, right? So there Organizations are dependent on their outside environment. They also need to be aware of what's happening in their outside environment. Okay? Um, any organization that is not aware of what's going on in their outside environment is, is going to be blindsided by changes um, in that environment. Okay? We talk about this idea of environmental scanning. Okay? And they actually, this image, they, it looks like an eyeball for a reason. <laughs> um, an organization uses their information systems as a way of scanning the environment, of looking at the environment, being aware of changes, and deciding which changes in their environment are going to re, um, require some kind of response. Okay, so making that decision, you you know what's going on with um, your competitors, customers, the culture, the technology. Right, all of these different outside, um, outside environmental factors. Right, what do we need to be to to actually, um, what do we actually need to respond to, and what things can we not worry about? Right, and they they use their systems as a lens to do that environmental scanning. And we'll talk when we talk about particular types of systems. We'll get more into how they how they help in this scanning of the environment. Okay. For some organizations, disruptive technologies are, um, have, uh, disruptive technologies um, either as a first mover or a fast follower have changed their, um, their industry and their environment. Okay, and a disruptive technology is anything that brings broad sweeping changes to a business, to an industry, okay? Um, and they give you some examples, you know, the PC, the personal computer, the internet, huge disruptive technology, right? Um, the page rank algorithm. The page rank algorithm is the, the um, uh, is the algorithm that the Google search, Google search is based upon. Okay? It, it looked at other factors besides just keywords in order to rank the, um, the um, relevance of a particular uh, web page in a search. Okay? Other, other um, search engines look solely at, at um, keywords. And if you know anything about web, um, web development, there's ways, if you know what they're looking for, there's ways of sort of doctoring how your web page, um, how it's seen by those keyword searches and where it ends up. I've seen, um, there's actually a field in web pages, it, it, it's basically metadata, it, it's data just, just for the developers and for the, um, the software that searches for and ranks computer, I mean web pages, um, and this field, I've seen web pages that put every keyword they could possibly think of, stuff that has nothing to do with their web page, but they want to be as far, t as far um, close to the top of as many searches as possible, right? And with that page rank algorithm, algorithm, it gets around that and it takes additional factors in when they are ranking um, websites for a particular search. Okay. So you don't get it by paying the company? I kinda, I they do that, they do that too, but I'm talking about the, the natural search, the oh, natural okay. search results. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually different, you know, if you use Bing or Yahoo or Google. What it is. Up. Right. If you've never done this before, do a keyword search, the same search in at least the big four. Um, MSN or Bing, uh, Google, 
um, Yahoo, and the other one is like ask.com, um, right? If you do the same search in those, those you know, major four search engines, um, you'll come up with the same, you know, some of the same pages, but they're going to be in different order. Um, the top five or top ten will probably be pretty close to the same, but what shows up at the top is going to be different in the natural search results. Okay, there's always you know sponsored search searches a lot of times at the top and sort of as side banners, right? But they've um, over time have um, have in order to not deceive the people that are using their their search engines, they don't um, they actually delineate and show you now. Um, I remember using Google when they didn't delineate and the first, uh, they didn't actually make it, make you aware of the fact that the certain results were sponsored. Um, so, you know, you'd see s um, stuff at the top, but it was actually, they had actually paid to be there and there were, um, you know, discussions. There might have been lawsuits, if I remember about that, okay, because it's kind of deceptive, right? Um, now, when there's new, a new disruptive technology, um, you have two different major classes of companies in these types of technologies. Um, the first movers, this is the, the company that comes up with the disruptive, actually creates the disruptive technology. Okay? And first movers are not always, don't always um, benefit from the technologies they come up with. Okay? Um, the fast followers, these are firms that come up very quickly. Um, and capitalize on that particular technology. Sometimes the first movers come up with this great technology and they don't have the capital or the assets to actually benefit from that particular technology. So the first mover, there's other companies, maybe larger companies that come out and they take that technology, they use that technology in order to, um, because they have the capital and they have the assets to actually um, capitalize and utilize that, that technology in order to, to gain some kind of competitive advantage. Okay. And that your book has actually a lot of examples of stuff like this. Um, they give you an example of um, the, what's widely recognized as the first personal computer, the Altair 8800, um, was not, is not the, type, the computer that, um, that became popular and was utilized by people. Um, you know, Microsoft and IBM actually came behind, um, behind that company and created PCs based on that technology, but they were able to move forward and capitalize on that disruptive technology. Okay. Um, Citibank came up with the, the idea of the ATM. They actually came up with that technology, but um, all banks have have invested in that ATM technology, so really the only, um, you really have the consumers who are benefiting from that, um, from that particular technology. Okay. Now when we look at organizations, there are, they, there is um, this theorist named Minsberg that came up with these five classifications of organizational structure. Okay, different um, lo looking at different types of organizations. You have the entrepreneurial um, organizations, small startup organizations, young. Um, they usually have a very simple structure. Um, they, a lot, it seems like a lot of startups nowadays, um, especially technology startups, one of, the, one of their, their goals could be just to create a technology that somebody else is interested in and that will actually purchase your technology so that you can kind of cash out, right? Um, Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, all these major um, techno technology companies do a lot of purchasing of, other, of the technology of others and incorporating it into their products. Apple, um, in their next, um, the next, uh, version of their operating system for their mobile devices, the, the iPhone as well as the um, iPad. They are going, they, for a long time they had uh, Google Maps as their map, um, their map tool that was built in. They, they actually purchased um, a couple of, two or three small companies and they're incorporating that into their own software so they can create their own 
um, their own map software. So in the next version of that, there it's iOS 6 um, that they actually introduced and talked about earlier this week or last week, I think. Um, it's supposed to have, it's supposed to be sometime this summer, and it's going to have their own map, uh, map application, which is supposed to be better than what Google has, but again, time will tell, right? Um, so you have those entrepreneurial, start, those very small startup companies. Um, you have machine bureaucracies. These are um, usually very large um, bureaucracy in a slow changing environment um, that are producing a very standard type of good. So this is, um, these are companies that are in a relatively stable industry. There's not, a, you know, the, the environment doesn't change as quickly as it does for the entrepreneurial industry, um, entrepreneurial organizations. Divisionalized bureaucracies actually are um, multiple machine bureaucracies all together in one umbrella, and each one of the machine bureaucracies um, creates a different product. So Procter and Gamble is a really good example of this. Uh, Procter and Gamble has a very, a very broad product mix. A lot of different products come under the umbrella of the Procter and Gamble company. Johnson and Johnson is another one. Okay. Um, professional bureaucracies. The University of Laverne is a, a an example of a professional bureaucracy. Um, it's a knowledge-based organization that relies on the knowledge and expertise of, um, of its workers. Okay, so here at the University of Laverne, the product that we produce is, is an education. Okay, and they rely on the instructors to, um, to actually create that product. Okay. But you can, you know, some of the other examples, law firms, hospitals, they're all, they all fall under this professional bureaucracy. They're, they're very um, dependent upon the expertise of the people that work, the professionals that work there. Okay? And this ad hoc, ad hocracy, <laughs> um, these are task force type of organizations. Um, they, have, they respond rapidly to a changing environment. The best example of those are, um, um, are your consulting firms. Consulting, and they give an example of a consulting firm in your book, and they talk about how these consulting firms are not centralized. They're very decentralized organizations. Um, they don't, they, um, you have, um, consultants in these organizations that come together for a for task-based projects, um, short-term, relatively short-term projects, right? They complete the project and then they break up the group and form new groups. So they're constantly, it's, it's constant churning of projects and tasks, okay? Move forward with that. There's other organizational features you have to take into account, the goals of the organization, right? What are, you know, what's the mission statement? What, what do we strive to be or strive to do? What, in, what um, industry are we in? When you look at your industry, are you focused on a particular niche of that industry, right? There's some, <clears throat> some organizations that are focused on um, particular niches and they are, uh, they can charge different price structures because they are because they are um, focused. Um, the constituencies, these are groups, um, either inside or outside the organization, that are dependent on and, and work inside the structure of the organization. Okay? Every organization is going to have a different, different leadership style, and the leadership style is going to affect how the organization views the use of information systems, how they view um, uh, implementation and um, investment in organization, um, in uh, information systems. Um, you have different tasks, and we talked about this idea of tasks and business processes, and then the surrounding environments, which again, when we talk about um, the five forces model, we'll get into 
um, what Michael Porter believed was the major five different forces that affect an organization. Okay. Now we can also kind of look at um, organizations and how um, how information systems imp um, impact those organizations through um, a few different lenses. These are theories that we'll talk about. Um, generally, the way that, that information systems affect organizations economically is that they tend to reduce costs. You, um, some of this is through automation. Okay, You um, automate some business processes so that you are, um, you, are, you are more efficient, you have higher productivity, um, it can help to reduce um, um, costs in things like labor and other capital. Um, it can also help to reduce the size of organizations. So if you have, um, you have investments in IT that, um, that enable managers to make better, quicker decisions, you can have less managers. Um, Right, and they talk about this, this idea of outsourcing, which we'll actually visit in a little bit more detail later on. Okay. So one theory that, one kind of theorist lens that you can look at organizations through is the transaction cost theory. Okay. For an organization to get something from the outside environment that they need, there is a cost to that, a transaction cost. Okay. Um, and, and some organizations use certain tools to try to reduce those transaction costs. Vertical integration. Uh, McDonald's, is, um, McDonald's is famous for their vertical integration. They actually, uh, when they move into a new market, they will purchase some of the suppliers of their beef, of their, of their potatoes, of their food, their, their, uh, their food supplies in those markets to try to integrate them and have greater control over the quality of the products they're receiving and that they are featuring in their in their restaurants. Um, hiring more employees, buying suppliers and distributors. So all of these are different ways of trying to bring down those transaction costs. Now, um, using the use of IT, either through customer relationship management systems where you're connecting with your customers or supply chain management systems where you're connecting with your suppliers. Um, the, the use of these systems to integrate information sharing among these different supply chain um, partners makes it so that it is cheaper to partner with your, or your supply chain partners rather than just uh, growing the size of your organization, which is one alternative to trying to reduce the costs of, um, to re reduce the cost of the transactions in, in your particular market. Okay, so this looks at the fact that when your transaction, the higher transaction costs you have, the larger your firm size. Okay, so when you're using IT to reduce the transaction costs, you also um, tend to have smaller organizations. Okay, um, so that goes, you know, it goes into that idea that the, the trend that we've seen where organizations will downsize. Um, try to find more efficient ways of using technology to um, improve their, uh, their processes um, and save and, and, and lower these transaction costs that they have. Okay? Agency theory. Um, with agency theory, you're looking at this idea that um, an organization is a collection of different agents. Okay, and you have um, you have a sort of a top level um, agent that CEO uh, owner of a company that employs other people to do to actually um, uh, do things for the organization on their behalf, right? Uh, for some small small companies, you can afford to do everything yourself, and but after a while, you have to start farming out and getting other people to do things for you because as you you know as your your company grows, you just can't do everything yourself. Okay. Now, agency theory says that 
the more people you have, the bigger that you grow, the harder it is for you to manage all of those people. Okay? Um, and if you're not overseeing what they're doing, your agents may naturally start to um, do things more for themselves rather than for their, the company, the good of the company. Okay, whether that's true or not. Um, <laughs> it's a general theory, so it's not, uh, it's kind of the management theory that, that people, you know, need to be supervised and need to be, to be watched. Okay, um, with um, IT, you can reduce those, those costs, those management costs because you're putting um, information systems and better information in the hands of your employees. You're empowering them to make decisions that you would have um, had to have um, had more managers to do in order to do that. Okay, so you can um, cut the cost of supervising without, you know, adding employees and actually possibly, again, shrinking the organization. So, again, with the agency costs, the, um, the larger the firm size, the lower those costs are as you go, oh, um, the, smaller, um, the smaller your organization is, the higher those costs are, um, traditionally. Okay. You can also look at some of the um, organizational and behavioral impacts of information systems on an organization. Um, you probably have heard of this um, this general finding that IT flattens organizations. It goes hand in hand with the idea that um, the transaction co the transaction cost um, theory and agency theory. Um, but it, again, it's this idea that you are enabling decision making at lower levels of the organization. You are empowering people to make decisions without having um, without having to be supervised as much. Okay, so you end up with much flatter organizations. Okay, instead of having you know multiple tiers of middle managers, you start to cut out these multiple tiers. You have less managers. Um, IT enables top level management to supervise um, more more people um, and actually reducing the cost and the the amount of um, levels of management now. Can you think of any benefits to having a flatter organization? Less, less bureaucracy, right? Um, when you have more people, it's kind of sometimes it's like telephone. <laughs> when you have more people, the message sometimes it changes when it gets from one part of the organization to another, right? So if you are um, if you are a you know a low, lower level employee and you have the ear of the CEO. Right, that can be very empowering. Right, you um, you might be subject less so to your supervisor's whims or their, um, you know, up the politics that have you know that that naturally happen in organizations. Right, so this flattening, this is an I, this is a concept that is enabled through the use of IT organizations. Okay. Um, you can also look at the fact that post-industrial organizations rely more so on knowledge rather than um, on formal positions. So um, instead of um, you're looking at, at having people that um, are better at making decisions, more educated, actually a, a much more educated um, workforce. Um, and because of this, it helps to, it's another theory that kind of helps to flatten the organization. Okay. Another, or, um, another factor that you have to be aware of when it comes to information systems use in an organization and how information systems affect an organization is that in a lot of organizations, there may be resistance to change. Okay. Um, you may have things like organizational politics, the culture of the organization that add to um, this uh, resistance to change that is maybe evident in the organization. Okay, um, when we talk about systems development, which is actually toward the toward the end of the class, we're going to talk about um, 
different projects and information system projects and what those projects need, one of the things that a successful information system project in an organization needs is a champion, somebody, um, a high level manager who believes in the project and can at every turn sell the project and uh, talk up the project and be behind the project. If you don't have a high level champion for a system, um, there's a good chance that it's not going to be successful in one way or another. And we talk about the different ways that organization, that information systems projects can be considered successful or not successful, okay? Um, but again, you know, one of the major reasons why you might have a, a system, uh, information system project that's a failure is because of some of these political and cultural, um, uh, political and cultural factors in an organization. And this, this is a way of looking at these different factors within an organization and the fact that when you change, when you're making changes in an organization, particularly, we're focused particularly on, on information systems, you have to change all four of these factors at the same time. You can't just change one of these factors and expect that the others can stay the same and that this, the change will be successful. You actually have to look at organizational change in a very, um, a, a very kind of three, 360 way. You have to look at the fact that it's going, the technology, um, what are the tasks or um, routines that we're going to change. You have to do some change management in regards to the people that change is going to affect. And then of course you have to look at the structure of the organization and how is that new system or how is that um, how is that going to make changes to the structure of the organization? Okay. Now again, the internet is one of um, one of the major disruptive technologies that we've seen in the past, you know, 20, 30 years. All right. Um, and as we mentioned in, um, in in some of the earlier chapters, the internet um, the internet makes has created a, uh, a very uh, more even playing field. You have smaller companies that were able to, um, to show up using the internet and um, become you know, much larger uh, industry dominant companies. Right? Can you think of what are some companies that without the internet they wouldn't even be around? eBay. Um, eBay? <coughs> Amazon, right? And there's always the social network flavor of the week, right? Pinterest was the big thing for a while, right? Twitter had its moment in the sun. Um, Facebook is kind of continuously in the news and media, right? So the internet can lower, remember we talked about those transaction and agency costs? The internet can help to lower that because the internet enables companies to get information very quickly, to share information very quickly, right? Um, Informa sharing information in a very cost-effective manner is one of the huge changes that the internet had on organizations, right? Using email, um, connecting and sharing information in soft copy or PDF format, being able to put up discussion forums that um, users of a product can go and share real-life experiences and help one another. Right? All of this has really um, changed the way that organizations connect with their customers, the way their customers connect with one another, and it's um, also helped to reduce a lot of those costs that we talked about, those agency and transaction costs. Okay? So when you're looking at organi an organization, um, some of the factors to consider when you're planning a new system, of course the environment, right? What structure does your organization have? Is it a a regular hierarchy? Is it some kind of specialization? Um, what kinds of routines and business processes are, um, are in your organization and how are they going to change with this new project? Right? Culture and politics is something you always have to take into account. Um, the type of organization and the style of leadership. Because again, the style of leadership is going to um, obviously affect the culture um, and the types of systems that um, will support managerial decision-making in that particular system, um, organization. 
Um, what are some of the interest groups that are affected by the system? Um, you have your end users, the people that are actually going to be using the system. How do they feel about the new system? Um, <laughs> a lot of times, um, especially if the system has not been the, the uh, benefits of the new system have not been presented to them in a way that makes them, you know, accept the change. For the most part, you know, when you're told that you're going to have to use a new system and learn a new way of doing things that you've done for a long time, um, your, your first reaction, you know, you, quite often is, I don't really want to change. <laughs> the old way of doing things was fine, right? So when you're, when you have organizational change that's caused by these new systems, you really have to invest in change management. There's a whole whole um, area of study in regards to change management and successful versus unsuccessful change management. And then of course the task decisions and processes that that system is going to exist, right? Assist. What, what, how do we do things now and how are we going to be able to do things after that system is, is up and running, right? So we can look at this, this idea of how do we, how do, we um, do that environmental scanning that we talked about, right? Organizations, successful organizations have to be aware of what's happening not only inside their organization but outside their organization, okay? And one way of doing this is, is to use Michael Porter's uh, five forces or competitive forces model. Okay. It gives a, um, a kind of a general environmental scan of the different um, environmental factors that affect the organization. Okay. Um, and it talks about five different competitive forces. Okay. Who are your traditional competitors? Um, who are, how easy is it for new entrants, um, new competitors to, to enter the market? Um, how many, you know, are, are there a lot of substitute products or services for your, pro your particular product? Um, what's the power, the, um, the power of the customers and the suppliers, right? And we'll talk about each one of these in a little bit more detail. But this is um, how you view those five forces, okay? They're all, most of them are external, you, you know, the firm and the internal rivalry within the, organ, within the industry, right? But you have the different power of the suppliers, the customers, the new market entrants, etc. Okay. <coughs> um, your, for the, pa the, the power of your traditional competition, how, um, how heated is the competition in your particular market? Okay. Can you think of an industry where they have very heated competition? There's a lot of competition. You might be able to see it through some of their marketing, um, promotional. Um, cell phones? Cell phones? Yes, that's definitely a very, very competitive market. And it's, you can look at it in a, as cell phone, the cell phone industry can be broken down in a couple of different pieces. You have the cell phone providers, you have the um, hardware and you have the hardware and the software manufacturers, right? So each and each one of those components of that market, it's very extremely competitive, right? You get a, a new phone and it seems like within um, you know within a few months there's something better um, on the horizon, right? So you can look at and evaluate how competitive um, your your particular industry is. Okay, and um, companies um, try to kind of keep, hold on to and keep their um, their market share using things like in, like um, enforcing things like um, switching costs, right? So the cell phone industry is actually a really good example of um, of a switching cost, right? What's the switching cost that they that they impose on um, on their consumers? What form does it take? You mean like offering the free phone, but then they just tack it on with um, you know, service, charge yeah. more? Contracts, yeah. right? Or like the data service plan. Right, right. So we'll give you a free, um, we'll 
give you a free or reduced um, phone price, but you have to sign into your contract to get that, right? Most phones, the newer phones, um, you know, seven, eight hundred dollars if you want to buy it without a contract, right? Um, so they lock you in two years worth of monthly payments for, um, you know, for your your thirty dollar data plan, your you know forty or fifty or sixty dollar um, voice voice plan, right? So that's definitely switching costs, and there's other industries that impose switching costs. Okay, but that's the most, that's probably the, the best example of a very clear switching cost that's imposed on customers. Okay, for new, the force of new uh, market entrants, how easy is it for new startup companies to get into your industry and to be competitive and successful in that industry, right? When you're looking at that, so if, if, it's, um, if it's very easy for new, um, new entrants to enter your market, then you, um, then the power of your entrance, of your new um, market entrance is very high. If it's hard for them to get in, it's very low. And usually this is, um, this is affected by the barriers to entry in a market, okay? Um, some industries have very high barriers to entry. Can you think of any industries that have, uh, and a barrier to entry is anything that customers expect or that you have to have as a minimum to be competitive in that particular market as a company. Can you think of any markets that um, have uh, that have um, very high barriers to entry? Huh? Oil. Oil, right? Highly regulated, very expensive. There's a lot of upfront costs if you want to become, you know, you want to open up a new oil company, <laughs> right? It just doesn't happen overnight. What about a company that has very low barriers to entry? <clears throat> liquor stores? Liquor stores, yeah. Very small mom and pop type of markets. Um, restaurants, depending on the type of market, restaurants and bars, very, you have uh, new entrants to, the, to that particular market, market all the time, the hospitality market, right? So, and some of the barriers to entry, some of them are re regulations, some of them are um, our technology that you need to have in order to be um, to be competitive in that market. So, I'll give you an example: um, package delivery companies, right? As as if I decided I wanted to um, open up a new package delivery company to be successful or to even be competitive in that industry. What are some of the things I have to have? The tracking. Tracking is a big one, right? If, if I open up a new company and I don't let you as a, cu a customer track your packages, I'm probably not going to be a new company for very long. Because <laughs> it's something that we expect we should be able to do, okay? Substitute products and services, right? This is anything that, um, that, might, um, that might take the place of your particular product or your particular service, okay? Um, Substitutes um, might, if it's especially if it's something that that um, lowers the cost of your product or your good, like digital music versus um, the cost of manufacturing a CD. Right, it's still more expensive um, to purchase a, a physical CD than it is for, in most markets than it is to purchase digital downloads of all the music on that CD. Okay, because of the, the costs of manufacturing that, you know, the physical disc, okay? Um, for the, the, the bargaining power of customers, customers, the bargaining power of customers is, um, is high if customers have a lot of choices. So um, what are, what's an industry where, custom, where you as a customer might have a lot of different choices? <laughs> right, a lot of a lot of um, you know physical goods, right? Um, a lot, a lot of different choices that you have, right? Retail, general retail. Um, there's a lot of different choices, right? Especially now with the internet, right? You can purchase, you can go into you know physical stores, you can go online and purchase goods, okay? Um, and electronics, consumer electronics, a lot of different choices out there. 
for you where you can get those consumer electronics. Okay. Um, suppliers, again, and suppliers, it, it works, the bargaining power of suppliers works kind of the same. If a supplier, if a particular um, organization has a lot of different suppliers that they can choose to get their supply from, then the suppliers have low bargaining power. Okay, because you, you, you increase the price of the supply, I'm just going to go to another supplier who will, who will provide it at the price that I'm comfortable paying. If, you have, uh, if you're in a position where you have um, very few suppliers of a raw material or a good, right, your suppliers have a lot of bargaining power. They can dictate how much they're going to charge you. Okay, there was um, there's a diet supplement called Ally. I don't know if you've heard of this diet supplement, but it was for about four or five months actually completely off the market because they were having issues with their supplier. One of the suppliers of the a supplier of the major ingredient of their that particular supplement. They, they, they didn't state in any of the information that I looked at, it, I couldn't tell exactly what the problem was. Um, but I'm sure it was a dispute over price um, or something having to do with uh, the availability of that product, right? As, um, as the availability of a particular product is, as if it's less available, right, the price is going to go up, right? So maybe it just, it was going to drive the price of that particular good, um, uh, um, price it out, out of the market, right? Because there's a there's certain a certain price points that people will pay for things like diet supplements. When it hits a certain price point, they're not going to want to pay that anymore. They're just going to switch to something else, right? Okay. So those are the five different um, competitive forces. And again, um, it's something that you should definitely be familiar with because you're going to see that on your on your midterm for sure and in your group projects. Um, Organizations also look at their general strategies that they're going to pursue. Okay, this is called the generic strategies. This is also um, a Michael Porter um, theory. Okay, um, the, the, some of the the four different generic strategies. You have low cost leadership, right? Give me an example of a low cost leadership company. A company whose whose Overall strategy is to be a low cost in their low cost leader in their market. Walmart. Walmart, right? Product differentiation. Okay, this is where you try to differentiate yourself and your pr product from your competitors. Okay, can you have, give give an example of a company that uses this strategy? Uh, Apple, right? Um, how about focusing on a market niche? This is where you, you have a market and different, um, different target populations in that market, target um, consumers, right? But maybe you focus on a particular, a specialty niche in that particular, a small part of that market. Starbucks. Starbucks? They've actually, they actually created a niche for themselves, really. I mean, very expensive, high-end coffee, right? UPS? How do they differentiate themselves from their um, competitors? <laughs> Actually, they 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 do, but they, they it's not a sustainable. Um, it's, it wasn't a sustainable competitive advantage. They actually invested very highly in technology, um, and they the technology that they use. Um, actually changed the way that they scheduled trucks, the way that they um, set up routes for trucks, um, and it, cha it changed the tracking and the, the availability of that information to their, their customers. So they do do, um, it was more of a competitive advantage that they, they pursued using technology. Um, I'm trying to think of a company that would fit into this. There is a, a website called Itsy. Um, e T S Y. Um, it's all homemade, um, handmade types of goods. Very high. A lot of them is very, very high priced. Um, you know, you can buy costumes, you can buy clothing, you can buy home goods. Um, one of a kind types of items that are not mass produced. 
Um, but it's it, it and it appeals to the retail part of the part of the retail market, the overall retail market that is interested in these one of a kind. Um, in some instances, luxury types of items um, that you can't get in regular stores, right? So they are appealing to a particular part of that uh, particular market niche. Um, and then strengthening customer and supplier intimacy. And a lot of times this is done using IT. Um, when we talk about supply chain management and we talk about customer relationship management, we'll get into uh, more detail about how companies um, strengthen that intimacy between their suppliers and their customers and, them, and themselves. Okay. So again, you have an example. Uh, Walmart was de is is to a certain extent the uh, major business case in um, low cost. They uh, low cost leadership. They everything that they do in their company from the very top of their company all the way to their operations. Um, supports that low-cost um, strategy. And so all of the investments they make in IT should support that strategy. And that's one of the things that for some companies it can be hard to do is to align your investments in IT with the particular strategy that your company is pursuing. So that every um, investment in IT uh, supports the strategy. Right? So Walmart is not um, going to invest in remodeling their stores to have, um, to have um, little areas that you can sit and hang out in their stores. Right? That's not really, that's not a part of their, their strategy. Right? They're, they don't really, they, they want you to come, they want you to buy stuff, right? But they don't necessarily want you to kind of sit around and hang out and, you know, that's not, that's not a part of their strategy. Okay, um, product differentiation, we said Apple, right, Google, um, and again, um, with product differentiation, you're just, you're pursuing the strategy of trying to be different from the other, um, your competitors in your particular market, okay. The example they use for focusing on a, on a market niche is Hilton, right, there's different, um, another example of focusing on, um, Oh, I think it's more just differentiation. Um, so Hilton, they use that example. Strengthening that customer um, and supplier intimacy, right? Amazon and Netflix both use a particular technology. You guys know what that technology is called? Uh, it's called, it's a recommender system. They both use recommender systems to, um, to provide this personalized experience for people that use their, their websites, right? If you guys have used Netflix, when you um, search for a movie and you put it in your queue, what happens after you click that, put it in, into your queue button if you've used Netflix? It saves it, it saves it but what op the pop-up opens? What does that pop-up have? The recommendations that you make. Similar, right. similar movies. Similar movies. And if, you, and if you pay attention to those similar movies, if you put in... Um, I'm trying to think of uh, something that just came out. Um, you put in a brand new movie um, like Prometheus. You can actually save stuff. So I go into my queue, I put Prometheus in there so that when it's available, it'll move it automatically into my queue. It'll open up um, a pop-up that gives me recommendations for things that are similar to that movie. If you pay attention to it, those, those recommendations are smaller movies, less they try, try to point you toward movies that have less demand, that are not new movies, that are not well-known well movies, because they want you to fill your queue with not just all of the brand new stuff, but that's going to be in high demand, that's going to be hard to get, right? But also some stuff that you might not have been aware of had you not had that recommender system not have, you know, made you aware of it. I have, my, my queue, it, it's, it's between, I love horror movies. Um, and I've watched more horror movies using Netflix than I would ever seen. I, I didn't even know that this, you know, this many horror movies were out there. My husband's like, I'm not going to watch. He doesn't watch any of them with me. Because I'm not very discerning when I watch. It looks interesting. I watch it. Some of them are really bad. <laughs> um, and he likes things like kids' movies. He mm -hmm. likes to watch, you know, and sometimes I'll watch them with him. So my cue, you know, my recommendations, right? Some of them are like 
recommending these kids movies, horror movies. Um, I let um, I let my niece uh, use Watch It Now, and she found all of the anime, so they're recommending anime in there. I'm like, people gotta stop using my Netflix queue, <laughs> right? But they, it, they they use that system to try to create this very personalized experience for you, so that you will use their you know their system over and over again, and they know how to control, right? They had to control, you know, Amazon, uh, Netflix using that that recommender where they try to point you toward less known, less lesser demand movies. Try to control um, the experience that you have in your queue to a certain extent, right? Amazon, how does their how does their recommender system work? You guys use have you used Amazon before? Books. How you may order a specific books and anything that's um, similar to that particular book, right? Uh, the, it, it'll pop up um, once you go in. Uh, it's like order the book or whatever. They put yeah, they do that. They they will recommend things that are similar. If you go in and you look at an item, if you scroll down, there's usually an area that says people that purchase this item also purchase this and this. And if you purchase that stuff together. We'll knock off a few bucks off of the price, right? That the the data mining technique they use to gather that information is called market basket analysis, looking at what people purchase together, right? Amazon uses that extensively to to uh, show what to make recommendations and hopefully up their profits, right? So instead of just buying um, one CD uh, by an artist that that I'm newly familiar with. They recommend two other CDs to go with it, and now I've spent money on three CDs instead of just one, right? It gives me my three bucks off or whatever. Okay, so it's a way of trying to um, capitalizing and trying to um, you know increase their profits. Right? So. With the, we talk about this idea of competitive advantage. Can anybody tell the class really quickly what a competitive advantage is? I think I want to mention this last week. Something that you have that the other competitors don't that makes you kind of stand out. Right, so it makes you more attractive, makes you, right. It's more something leverage. that, huh? And more leverage. More leverage, right makes you more attractive to your customers, okay? Um, and the internet has had um, a very big impact on competitive advantage. It has actually um, made some um, industries obsolete. Can you name an example of an industry that the internet has had a dis very destructive effect on? Right. Uh, <laughs> The uh, kind of face-to-face -face video stores have, you know, people people are looking at. Netflix was actually a big part of that um, the, that dramatic change in um, the way that we think about video rental. Okay, um, you know, kind of after that, you know, with Netflix, you blockbusters. They're still around, but there's very few of them. You still have some of the mom and pop. Um, uh, stores also, I can't remember the last time I walked into, I physically walked into a, a video store. I uh, wait for my Netflix to come in the mail, I open them up, watch them, and then I send them back. And I'm constantly adjusting my cues to make sure I know it's coming. Um, <laughs> travel agencies, right, definitely had a huge effect, right? All of these self-serve um, travel websites that came out, right, Orbis, Expedia, um, Hotels.com, they have all changed the way that we view planning our vacations, right? We are our trips, right? We feel more empowered to actually go and plan these things for ourselves versus feeling like we have to walk into a travel agency and sit down and talk to somebody, okay? The printed, um, I say printed encyclopedia, but the newspaper industry, right? Huge effect on the newspaper industry. Um, small regional newspapers um, closed down, um, you know, in huge numbers across the nation because it was really, because the expectations that we started to have as a society was that 
Um, why am I going to pay a subscription fee for a printed newspaper that is that has information that's 12 hours old? Right? When I can go online to CNN.com or to a uh, a newspaper website, and I can get information that is up to date. Right? CNN, they'll tell you, you know, this is something that was posted, you know, t 10 minutes ago or 20 minutes ago. Right? Why, why do I want to, you know, purchase a newspaper and sit there and read old information? Right? So the large companies, large newspaper companies, they adapted and they changed um, and started uh, and included this internet effect in their in the way that they did business, but smaller companies just couldn't compete. Okay. Okay. Um, the last model that we're going to look at, this is also again a Michael Porter uh, model, is the business chain. Uh, the I'm sorry, the the value chain model. Okay, and. Like the five forces or competitive forces model looked at the external environment for an organization, the value chain looks at the internal market, I mean the internal part of the organization. It looks at an organization as a collection of activities. Okay? And there's two major classifications or two different categories of, of activities. They're primary and support activities. Okay? Your um, your primary activities um, are those activities that add direct value to your product or service. Okay, so inbound logistics, production, outbound logistics, um, sales and uh, marketing, and of course, uh, you know, after-service type of customer care. Those all, those all of those activities that pretty much every company has has to have, right? Um, all of those activities add direct value to the product or service that you are that you are creating. Okay, and those are the primary activities. Um, support activities. These types of activities are the activities that companies need to have, but they don't add direct value to your product or service. Right. So things like human resources. Um, administration, finance, and accounting, right? We need to have those activities, but they're not adding direct value to the product, okay? Um, when you're looking at these two different types of activities, um, the value chain gives you a way of examining those activities and looking to see where we can utilize information systems to help to increase efficiency and it increase um, uh, productivity in these activities, particularly in those support activities, the activities that don't add value to the organism, to the don't add direct value to the product. Right? We start to look at things like benchmarking and best practices. Right? How do how can we um, streamline those processes so that the, the our overhead cost is much lower? Right? Because overhead cost eats into profit. Right? And so, um, and when we, t when we talk about in um, enterprise resource planning or ERP systems, we're going to revisit this idea of best practices and benchmarking because those types of systems utilize best practices extensively. Okay? Now, this is the visual that we have for the value chain, right? You have those support activities. And when we're viewing those support activities, they support the act the the um, they support the entire organization, right? Procurement, human resources, administration, uh, says techno uh, you know technology, your finance and accounting, things like that, right? And then your primary activities, these are um, parts of the organization that provide direct support and direct um, value to your your uh, your product or service, okay? We can also talk about this concept um, of a, called a value uh, web, where you have different, um, different firms that are coordinated um, using IT to produce a product or service collectively, okay? So, um, this can go hand in hand with that, with this, um, this co the concept of um, kind of just-in-time inventory management, where you have um, 
Organizations that are very tightly integrated in regards to their information sharing so that they can have the utilization of, um, of inputs um, be at a, in a just-in-time nature. Okay? So here, this is a, an example, of, a visual example of um, a value web, right? You have a particular industry, right? Different um, organizations in the industry, your ERP systems that are connected to suppliers and customers using the supply chain management systems and your CRM systems. Um, connected to other indirect suppliers, right? We'll talk about um, this idea of extranets and intranets which both use the internet um, uh, technology to support that. And then, of course, strategic alliances. So, um, organizations, information systems can also help with things like um, creating synergies uh, among organizations. Um, mergers are an example of um, of possible synergies that are created. Sometimes mergers are not um, are not successful. The uh, Daimler Chrysler um, merger uh, that happened a few years ago um, was a was a mismatch in organizational culture, particularly organizational culture and management styles. Um, and there was a la actually a lack of synergy in those two companies. Um, that, act, that made that merger unsuccessful. They actually unmerged <laughs> after, I think, a couple of years of their merger trying to align their, um, their strategies and products together. Okay? Uh, the purchase of YouTube by Google, right? Um, and, and Google is one of those companies, you know, Google, Microsoft, um, Apple, major technology companies that will purchase smaller companies and incorporate them into their existing product offerings. Okay. Every organization has a core competency. Okay. Um, has something that they are known for. Okay. Um, when you're looking at an organization and you're thinking about their core competencies, um, you have, you ha this is important to, to think about um, because you don't want to outsource core competencies. Um, when, you're when you're looking at outsourcing um, different parts of the organization, um, you never outsource your core competencies. You can outsource, a lot of organizations outsource things like payroll um, because it's just cheaper to have somebody else do it for you than it would to do it, than it is to do it in-house. Um, you can also have, um, you know, network-based strategies where you're looking at a firm's ability to, um, different firm's abilities to network with each other, and you start to take advantage of um, some of the benefits of networking, including things like network economics, right? Um, having a virtual company um, and um, the kind of the business um, ecosystems that are available, okay? Um, with this, this idea of network um, economics, um, in traditional economics, you have this, the law of diminishing returns, where you get to a certain point um, where adding more inputs into a process is not going to increase um, increase your output or in, increase um, the, the, the particular output that you're getting. You get um, no more returns no matter how much more of your input that you're adding. Okay? Um, with network economics, um, the larger a network you have formed, um, the, the more that each network partner um, benefits. So if you create, um, you create a network, um, the more people that are uh, attached to that network, the, the larger a benefit you have to everybody in that particular network. Um, 
mainly because the marginal cost of adding a new participant is almost really close to zero. So everything that you're getting after a certain point is all benefit. Okay. Um, some companies use information systems to help um, uh, to create these virtual um, company strategies um, where you are essentially using others to um, uh, to create and distri distribute um, products without being limited to a particular organizational boundary, right? If you're a virtual company, you don't have to worry about, um, you may not have to worry about things like warehousing costs for traditional, you know, traditional goods. Maybe your, uh, you, um, things like eBay, <laughs> right? eBay is a, a really good example of a virtual company. They do not have um, they don't have any warehousing of goods. They're basically a third party that facilitates transactions. Um, so they don't have to worry about um, the, the, um, the cost of um, shipping goods. They don't, have, they don't do any of that. They facilitate the meeting of buyers and sellers who deal with the shipping and all of that, those other costs. Okay? So you can look at you know this example of an ecosystem uh, model where you have an industry ecosystem, different industries in here, new entrants, suppliers. You have those five forces. Um, some um, one of the major things. Yeah, go ahead. Um, did, like remember how I don't know how long ago. Things not, existing not really, and those eBay stores were. Um, I thought they were they were facilitating shipping, were they not? They were selling things for you. Oh, okay, so you could bring stuff in, and they would just sell and it. Was for it you? from eBay, or was it just like someone opened up a business? And no, I remember seeing the eBay stores. It wasn't the forty-year-old virgin or whatever. <laughs> the boots. <laughs> I just saw that movie, so. Um, but yeah, they did have they did have stores, but they were still. Um, it was still more facilitating transactions, but they were incurring storage costs because you could bring yeah. in you could bring. I just in wasn't sure that was ran by eBay, or it was just like I opened up it. It's a um, official logo. On it, I was gonna say it was it, at the very least it was a franchise because it did have I remember seeing like eBay stores. I don't, I don't think there's any more of those. I don't think that's There's a pass by on my board from Freya, but I'm not sure if they still have it. Yeah. So and I think it was just, you know, to help with people that are less tech savvy as far as and it seems like they've done a lot of improvement of their um, their systems um, to kind of integrate things like, you know, when you sell online, um, you can buy postage, you know, right through their system. For you know, for actually sending your 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 good, you don't have to go outside of the system. You can use some of your profits to actually um, pay for the postage. It's all they have a lot of really good integration into their existing you know auction software and system. Um, but yeah, that's they experiment every once in a while with stuff like that. You know, Amazon is actually completely virtual. Um, you. As far as retail locations, they they do hold some uh, you know warehousing costs, um, but you, to my knowledge, and I say this, one of these days I'm I'm going to say this to a class and somebody's going to tell me I'm wrong, but to my knowledge, there's no eBay store. I mean Amazon stores. You can't. You, you there's no place you can walk in and actually uh, an official Amazon store. Um, and I don't think unless unless uh, you know unless the market changes, I don't think that's something that they're really that interested in because they're doing so well online. Okay. Um, but sustaining a competitive advantage, once you get a competitive advantage, right, um, it's really, it can be really, really hard to sustain a competitive it's, it's easy to get a competitive advantage. You lower your prices, you offer some kind of promotion, um, you do things, you know, you, you implement some kind of technology that makes your service or your product better. Um, but eventually, your competitors are going to follow suit. Right? So sustaining those competitive advantages is one of the hardest things that organizations can do. Okay? Um, Apple 
with their, you know, their iPod and their iPhone, right? They, they're constantly having to come up with something new because the market changes, right? The current market for cell phones, um, Android actually surpasses iPhones almost two to one right now, okay? Um, which, you know, from, you know, three or four years ago, that wasn't the case. There was a, you know, iPhones were the, the dominant smartphone. Right? With, with the Android operating system as an alternative, right, people, you know, and, and the fact that when you get an Android machine, it can be running Android on a whole host of different um, headset, um, handsets, okay, so you're not locked into, if I want an iPhone, I'm going to get one of these three different types of iPhones. If I want an Android, I can get many different devices that that have that operating system on. Okay, so um, you know the the market changes, um, and they have to and sustaining those competitive advantages that they get from maybe first mover technologies, um, it's really hard to do. Okay, so 